Hello and welcome to Pale Reflections, a proud member of the Doof Network where we reflect on Wildbo's most triumvirate work as it releases. I'm Ruben Morehouse. And I'm Elliot Diebold. And we are here to talk about Pale, or to reflect on Pale, some would say. But before we do that, let's just do a little special announcement, which is that we, and when I say we, I'm including all of the Doof Media Network, are running a fan art contest where you can do fan art to win cool prizes, including the acclaim of the community. And I think a cash prize. Is that right, Elliot? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, it's, it's, we've made the page, but I've forgotten it and I don't have it in front of me. Um, it will be linked in the show notes. Um, yeah, so this is a, uh, you know, sort of complete fan art contest Wobbo away. Basically everything Wobbo except Twig is fair game. <laughs> yeah, um, since Twig, that's the only thing we haven't covered. Um, so we're kind of doing this in conjunction uh, with Matthias and Clarence over at yep. uh, Decomposing Worm. But send us yep. your packed art, your pale art, your you know, pair of humans if you must art. We should uh, say the theme of yes. the fan art contest, which is monsters. Ooh, which is, I think people will admit applies to pale and packed, but also the parahumans universe. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a pretty good, um, you know, nice general theme. So, so hit us up. We'll we'll put in some special effort to to you know make sure there's no spoilers that hit you uh when it comes to voting time uh yes. if you're a patron because it's our patrons who get to vote on the uh on mm -hmm. the winners and we, you'll find out if you aren't a patron we'll tell you how to become a patron later so stay tuned for that also coming up later in the show we're going to be talking about out on a limb 3.2 out on a limb 3.3 the bonus bit from this week which is called timelines as well as discussing some pale predictions and answers to our more recent discussion question should we get yeah. into it let's do it all right, so let's start with Out on the Limb 3.2, which is from the perspective of Lucy. So um, Avery's still locked in uh, in the uh, the Forest Ribbon Trail, and um, to, in order to get her out, the group is kind of preparing for negotiations. So we begin with a PE lesson, where Lucy and Verona begin preparing for this upcoming negotiation with the Belangers, and have a bit of a chit-chat with Melissa. Yeah, and like I love how this chapter opens with the line, every moment that Avery was gone, felt like added weight on Lucy's shoulders because it just <laughs> we can't <laughs> we can't get into a Lucy chapter without having a bit of a, a downer start can we yeah exactly it just like as a first line it just immediately put me in okay yep that's right we're in Lucy's head oh yeah Lucy, everything's yeah. on her shoulders okay yeah, she's got a lot of burdens <sighs> yeah I'm I'm right back on page uh it's great yeah gets us right into her headspace which is interesting I mean I don't think we've touched on too much the idea of uh, these three rotating protagonists, right? Which is something that Wildbo hasn't really done before outside of interlude arcs or interlude chapters or arcs, I guess. Um, but yeah, it, we, I, I find, and this happens in the next chapter as well, which is from Avery's perspective. And the first line is like, Kerry started cackling maniacally or something. And it's great how Wildbo manages to find these ways to put us right back, these like shorthands, that put us right back in the headspace that we need to be in for each of these characters. Yeah, you're right, because it's not something that he's had to deal with in the previous serials, like, because, you know, it, the interludes were a step out of the prota protagonist's point of view, so it's yes. a bit easier to immediately jump back in. Here we've got, we're juggling between these three. Um, so these yeah. these little opening lines that sort of put you back in that headspace are super important. Mm. Um, yeah. I also think it's really fun seeing... Like Lucy and Verona just interacting normally with their peers here, um, but like specifically, I I, I want to zoom in on the whole Melissa thing because so like Lucy basically attempts to kind of reach out and support Melissa, and and obviously Melissa's in a in a bad place, so um, she's kind of a shit about it, but realizes she was doing it. She's kind of appropriately ashamed of what she said, <laughs> um, yeah, and, and and I think like the big important thing here is Lucy is sort of like. It's fine. We'll give you a pass. And she she does more than say it. She actually follows through. Like she continues to help Melissa and like offer her a hand and and all this other stuff. Like it's just it kind of made me think about all the stuff we talked about with Booker um a couple of weeks ago, where it was sort of like you know she she's giving Melissa a bit of a chance and and she's recognizing Melissa's in a bad place. So she's like, look, I'll let that one slide, but no no more of that. Don't um, do it again. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, yeah, I don't know. I like, I, I really liked seeing Lucy go ahead with stuff like this. Yeah, um, yeah, it's great how like she is, she is 
cutting Melissa just the right appropriate amount of slack, you know? Like, um, I think Lucy does get a bit of a rap for being a hard ass, and she kind of is, but she also is fair, right? Which is good. Exactly. About her. Um, yeah, it's it's a very nice moment, right? Obviously, Melissa is in a rough place, and Lucy recognizes that and and cuts her some slack. And it, it's this, it's the trio that, well, not at the moment a trio, but you know, <laughs> the group. Um, they're they're there to solve magical problems, but also interpersonal problems. They're just uh, they're just <laughs> good. They're just capital G good. Yeah, and it's funny how. Lucy later on kind of writes it off as a bit of like, oh, you know, it's good karma. Um, yeah. But like, I think she's actually just a good person. No. Um, <laughs> no, Elliot, say it ain't so. <laughs> it's sort of, she, she's, she's trying to backwards justify. Um, yeah, it, it's yeah. just good to kind of see her like giving someone else who's having a bad time a, a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Especially Melissa, who's been someone that has received a lot of, I think, unfair animosity from the group right like they're, they're always hard on her for the fact that she likes including people basically well i mean the the worst thing about it is melissa seems kind of aware of that because she comments that all of the her other like cheerleading friends they just she's well her, the thing she says is she's like oh they just find me annoying they're they're only putting mm. up with me um because they needed someone in my position um mm. and like i kind of tempted to believe that she's right because that was sort of the impression the the Kenneteers had of her like up until now there was always a bit of like oh she's a bit annoying and like full on um so like yeah i don't know it, it's it, she's someone who really needed uh, uh somebody to extend an olive branch and i'm surprised and glad that lucy was the one to do it mm, yeah um yeah so they've been good about it yeah. Something else that also came up in my uh, live read is uh, Lucy has the dog tag with Corporal Bloggins on it, and I kind of made a joke about, like, oh, what a like, silly filler name. Like, the spirits couldn't come <laughs> up with anything. Um, so they just chucked Bloggins there. Uh, but it was pointed out to me um, that's actually a, like, term or, or a, like a word used specifically in the canadian military to talk about like to as a substitute for a kind of generic name like it's mm, kind of like, like the phrase john doe type. yeah it's just like the phrase john doe but specifically for the canadian military so you know our oh, private bloggins did blah 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 mm. um and and you know so knowing military culture it probably is supposed to come across as like a silly filler name um mm. but i i thought this was really important in how it, it, it's just reminding us about john's kind of mosaic nature like because he's john styles but his dog mm. tags which you know from a military standpoint are meant to represent like his name and his identity yeah are just like a completely different name yes and a, a generic name yeah as well. it, yeah and right. well another generic name i think like john and even John Styles was maybe along similar lines, like a different yes. sort of generic name. I mean, it's yeah. it's proof that there's some Canadian in him. Like he sort of talked about like being drawn to Kennet uh, because one of the people he was built from saw it as home. And um, I mean, I guess the fact that he's got bloggins on his dog tags is is another part of that. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yes, uh, Lucy and Verona uh, use Melissa to get out of school, basically. Um, <laughs> And they go and hitch a ride with Matthew in his ute, where Marisica and Guillaume uh, give them some negotiation lessons for the upcoming conflict. Yes. Um, so the thing I want to touch on, first of all, is the fact that when they get in the ute, Marisica is there, but she's there in this form of like a weird amalgamation of a few bugs caught in a spider's web, specifically three bugs trapped in a dense web of connections that are all in danger from some unknown spider but also are fighting amongst themselves is that <laughs> is that is that you think marisica's trying to get in their heads a bit or i don't know I, hmm. I, you know she's a fairy it's just a coincidence um i can't wait for you know three chapters later when you know lucy is like oh when marisica was doing this it signaled to me this and now it made me do this. <laughs> like that was the f this bug form is the first step in a chain of dominoes that are going to fuck them over. <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny. This didn't really jump out to me at all, but I went back after you wrote that note and read it and went, you're so right. So it's a moth, um, which is interesting because the moth activates when Verona talks to it. Um, mm. So it's Verona the moth. Um, but wait, the other yeah. one is, is actually a bat with a centipede in its mouth and the centipede yes. is sort of struggling. So... I, I'm trying to build some sort of metaphor where Avery is the centipede, or, or I don't mm. know. Mm. 
I, I, don't I don't know. know. I don't know I don't what know. to do with it. The, the thing that I thought when I, because the train of thought that led me there is, well, what the fuck? That's such a weird form to take. But I, I'm like, that could just be it, that it's just a weird thing to do, and that's the only reason <laughs> Risk is doing it. But I don't know. There has to be some reason why she's gone with something so specific as the form she's taking. Yeah, I, I, now that you've pointed it out, I'd be totally willing to believe that, you know, however many months down the line, we'll be able to look back at this form and be like, <laughs> uh-huh. Who knows what things are the clues and what things are just weird fairy shit, though. That's the problem. Yeah, I mean, knowing Wabo and having Red Pact, like, I'm almost certain it's got significance towards something. It's just, I, I feel like we won't know until it's in retrospect what it was signifying yeah 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 um, fair enough but I, like i mean i think the other thing that i sort of got out of marisica from this segment was uh, like this uh, this is when i was like okay this is really fucking serious because marisica is just straight up like answering questions and telling them what they need to know <laughs> like, she, actually genuinely helpful yeah she's like hey listen uh i thought i'd give you some lessons no traps or ploys and then verona asks some follow-up questions and she just answers them and i was like yeah. okay i'm following a conversation with marissa in it this is like it's serious yeah exactly like my my assumption is marissa is doing this like fighting her nature like this because she's a little bit scared and i'm like okay well if marissa taking this seriously like it's fucking serious mm. i mean yeah. i guess there's always the chance it's a ploy on a ploy on a ploy she's doing this as part of the ploy to make them take it seriously and but mm. like, fuck, i'm not playing that game <laughs> I'll, I'll lose you, you just can't at a certain level right you just can't go so deep on it um but yeah so so Mariska sort of gives them two well and Guillaume he he shows up halfway through as well yeah. um sort of give them two chunks of advice and we'll probably talk about them more like as the negotiations happen um but this is where you start to see why I think this had to be a, a Lucy chapter specifically mm. um because the two things are sort of don't play Alexander's game and then also like karma is something you need to be watching for in these conversations. Yeah. And I was kind of halfway through this trip in the Ute when it when it really jumped out to me of like, I just had this sudden moment of like, we're so beyond the murder of the Carmine Beast now. Like, I, it's so, we're so many steps past solving the murder of the Carmine Beast. It Like, it feels like, it feels like, We've gone down such a path of events that that it can't be unintentional. That that potentially somebody, one of the Kennet others, who's the culprit, whose name is probably Edith, intentionally got <laughs> the Belangers interested in Kennet to cause a distraction. But I don't like. I don't know. It just seems so counterproductive for the Kennet other for anyone to have done that because obviously, like this is such a a problem yeah I, I think by the time we get to the extra material there's some directions we're definitely being pushed in thinking um with regards to who could be pulling these strings um but yeah like i agree there was actually a point in 3.3 .3 where lucy talks about the culprit and i was like tripped up on that word and started like tinfoiling it during my live read before i meant she before i realized she just meant whoever killed the carmine beast like i had just yeah. forgotten that that was that part of this story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because it's been such a, like, the the trio have never had the time to really, we got the interviews in the first arc, basically, um, and then since then, the trio just haven't had the time to deal with it. Like, it's just been so many distractions. Yeah, oh, there were a few more interviews in, in arc two, but yeah, like, I agree. Where we're in arc three, there's been hungry choir rituals, there's been forest ribbon trails, and they still haven't done all the interviews. Like, yeah. it's hard not to read this as some sort of intentional, active interference. Yes. Um, they're about to go to fucking Hogwarts, like... <laughs> yeah. The, uh, anti the anti-Hogwarts, please. The anti-Hogwarts, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, something that I've been really enjoying, though, is as they've gone through each of these different distractions, they've had, like, a different other instructing them in them. And it's it's great because we have things like... We can do things like the fairy here being the mentor for this, like, hostile negotiation which is exactly the other that you want to be talking to this about because it's to, so to be talking to about this because it's so like this whole encounter is so about like the tricks of words that are employed. And it's just great that we have fairy being able to be the mentors for that. And, you know, miss was the mentor for the forest ribbon trail. And we can just have 
like experts dive in and, and give advice to the trio in a way that it's very satisfying as an audience member. Yeah, and this is the this is the craziest thing to me about them wanting or needing to go to the Blue Heron Institute is it's a hellhole of of people who are like teach you very specific things, but it's like they've got access to like a wider array, array of of masters than like Nicolette seems to. Yeah. Um it, like you're right, this is exactly the sort of situation you want a fairy for, um mm. like on your side. So it's like yeah it's all coming back to that stuff of like i don't think we appreciated how good a situation they were in like relative to a lot of other practitioners and this this sort of thing that you're bringing up just highlights like they have so many different people they can tap it's like yeah great yeah yeah definitely um so uh the team arrive at the scene of the negotiations and edith is Preparing, but yeah, preparing, <laughs> I guess, is the only real word for it. Doing some insane preparation. I mean, how much did this throw you for a loop, like, the first time I, you were reading it? I had it? so much <laughs> trouble following what exactly she was doing. <laughs> Basically, she, like, coats the entire area in layers of wax uh, as, an, a, as a way to, you know, like, imbue her essence into it. Um, wax and candles, I should say. Oh, and also she's, like, outside of her own body. <laughs> There's like four different layers of weird shit going on here. Um, yeah. Well, and the description yeah. opens with uh, like a focus on the forest ribbon trail. Uh, or sorry, no, wait, the, the cabin. Cause, the cabin. Yeah. And, and there's all the ribbons sort of coming out of it. And and so I was like, mm. oh, my God, is the, is it like leaking? And then it sort of starts to zoom in on Edith. And I was like, oh, so she stood some She's just doing shit. some weird shit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's great. Like, I've we haven't really seen what edith is capable of this is the first time we've seen edith do anything right like that isn't teach the girls some pretty much some magic tricks and it's great because I, it's starting to set up that she, we're gonna have the final showdown with edith after she's revealed <laughs> to be the murderer and she's gonna have all these cool spirit candle wax tricks that are pulled up her, out of her sleeve and i'm just really excited for that eventual scene yeah well and i think something that this scene does it really taps into what i yeah, specifically love about the 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 world of of Pact and Pale. Um, so my understanding is she's basically imbuing this area with just sort of her essence and setting it up. So, um, like she's basically doing what you do in an RPG, where you you know, like in Pokemon, where you use Sunny Day to sort of mm-hmm. uh, in, like power up fire type moves and that sort of thing. Yeah. Like that's basically what yeah. she's done. Um, yeah, she's supercharging those essences in the area because they're her thing. Um, but the way she does that is because she can sort of bring the spirit world closer because that's like what candles are used for. Like candles are mm. symbolically associated with lots of like rituals and, and spiritual stuff. And as a spirit of like candles, um, she can tap into that. And it's just one of those things, like what I love about this world, it's I never would have predicted that she could do that. But when it's explained to me, I'm like, oh, yeah, obviously makes that makes sense. sense. Exactly. Um, yeah, and it's, it's that, it is very cool, isn't it? Yeah, there's just like a breadth to the the powers in this world where things can come completely sort of out of left field or something I wouldn't have expected, but it doesn't feel cheap at all because as soon as you sort of think about it, you're like, okay, no, like I, I do see that in retrospect. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the exact kind of thing of it's a cool trick that makes perfect sense, but you wouldn't have thought about it beforehand, which is like what this universe thrives on. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so our opponents in this debate, the Belangers, arrive, and immediately Verona and Lucy are going on the offensive. It's so good. Like, yeah, Verona good, just immediately launches into, like, everything Marissa Kerr and Girl May were talking about in sort of, you know, being belligerent, and it's hilarious as and, and awesome. Like, finally, she gets to use all the skills her dad has imparted on her. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I was really impressed with how well they put the Belangers on the back foot immediately. So they they go after Alexander with this tack of like, are you going to take responsibility? And he's like, no. And so they're like, all right, then fuck off. And it's just like (laughs) so effectively boiling this down to a binary of either do something or get the fuck out of the way. And he doesn't really ever have a way to counter that. That's just the, the beat that they drive home and it works like they really effectively get Alexander out of the picture through this. It's great. 
Yeah, and for the most part, they managed to dodge his attempts, uh, his attempts to dodge questions, sidestep yes. stuff. Um, yeah. And yeah, so like I, I want to talk a bit about why I think this had to be a Lucy chapter, like as we're sort of seeing them do this, because um, it's essentially the, the main advice Marisica and, and Guillaume were sort of giving them was playing the sort of intellectual or polite game just won't work because Alexander has thrived in that system it's kind of stacked in his favor. He has more resources and knowledge. Like yeah. playing his game just won't work. And yeah, I feel like set the rules. Yeah. And, and I feel like, you know, here in July of 2020, when we're recording this, mm-hmm. it's hard not to sort of tie this back to all of the discussions that have been around like black lives matter um, mm. and, and, or really anything about any sort of oppressed group trying to stand up for themselves where, yeah. Just systemic oppression in general as well. Right? Yeah. And we've talked about that with Lucy already, but the idea that the system is so stacked against Lucy or against the trio if they're dealing with Alexander, who is, you know, a representation of the system. <laughs> he is the institution, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. It's, yeah, you can't, you if you want to dismantle the institution, you can't play it by the institution's rules. And uh, they don't, and it works quite effectively. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the uh, like I I I can't not see that sort of connection. Like right? there's this sense that it's just like if you just try to be polite and and stuff like he's just kind of going to get what he wants because that's how it's all designed. Where like you need to go outside the rules a bit. Yeah. Um and in um, fact that there was there was actually a, a lot of great stuff on this. Um I just wanted to plug uh I've got it written down like a, 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 one of our Discord users wrote a post on Reddit, uh Tanky Forecast, but I'm now realizing i didn't actually check the reddit post so they might have a different reddit username um i'll 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 put a comment in our discussion thread linking to it but it's this great post talking about um so something i i had no idea since i'm i'm australian uh is booker uh lucy's brother is named after a a famous um african-american mm. activist um mm. and booker uh, like the historical booker t washington had um a lot of interactions with uh another one uh, another person uh w u b du bois or something yeah, uh, yeah w du bois i think yeah i'm sorry i'm not sure how to pronounce this stuff i've only just <laughs> learned about these people um but basically they these two had different opinions on like exactly you know how to to fight oppression um and Basically, Booker, Lucy's brother, uh, his his sort of strategy seemed to line up a lot with the historical um, yes. Booker Washington's ones, and um, then so Booker Booker historical Booker's strategy was to you know represent the best possible version of yourself and and not trust but kind of work towards uh, you know equality uh, and dismantling oppression in a nonviolent and kind of positive way, whereas Dubois believed in that but also believed in aggressively tackling oppression whenever you found it right yeah and it feels like there are parallels between those two and lucy and lucy pale and booker. booker yeah um and, and tanky sort of points all this out and and it gives a bit of a history lesson to those of us who, who don't have this context it's a really great post and, and you should go check it out so um yeah yeah i will link to it in the discussion thread yeah um so yeah to, to jump back to the interaction with alexander i yeah I'm, I am. I was very interested by it because you know before this chapter, I felt like okay, we're having the showdown with Alexander, right? We have this showdown that's about to happen. But during this chapter, you actually realize this isn't the showdown with Alexander. This is just him like scoping them out. He he really doesn't even engage. He barely he barely engages to anything that they say. And as soon as they even slightly start to challenge him in a way that he feels like he'll have to actively expend effort to deal with. He kind of just backs down, um, and it's it's interesting. It's it it feels like there's more conflict with Alexander that's going to come up, and the fact that he's just kind of let them, you know, blow their tickets in this one is is a way that he's negotiating for the second or third time they cross paths. Yeah, like there's there's definitely moments where it feels like they're winning this battle. But as soon as you start to take a step back, you just can't help. And, and like, even Lucy gets this impression that, like, Alexander is thinking about the war, so to speak. Like, they yeah. they do well here, but it, it doesn't feel like Alexander is put in a permanently tough position. Like, and, and they sort of talk about how, in, in the end, he 
kind of gets what he wants. Like, probably not in as easy or nice a way as he would like it, but at the end of the day, this isn't a complete loss for him, and he's sort of okay with that, and I don't like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, if anything, he, he didn't know this going in, but these this trio and Charles and, and Miss had one big card up their sleeve, a card that really could have fucked over Alexander to a large extent, and this interaction has had him take that card off of the table. So. He didn't win, but by no means was this a loss for him either, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, really, really the loser out of all this is Nicolette. Yes. Which, like, I mean, you know, we, we it was so recently in her head, you can just sort of picture how fucking enraged she must be by everything yes. that just happened here. Yeah. Uh, um, we, we get glimpses of that through, through Lucy. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, you know, because in these these three are about to get like free tuition which just like from her perspective you know is just sort of another, salt in the wound yeah. it's another silver spoon they've been handed right? exactly yeah. um yeah like i feel bad for her mm. yeah for sure um he does drop some juicy nuggets that we should talk about because the hungry choir is the thing the topic of discussion basically one of the things he offers is information on the hungry choir and he gives some information and Honestly, the, the, the main information that the main nugget that we get here is the fact that the Hungry Choir didn't just happen, basically. Something more is going on with the Hungry Choir. Either someone created it or is feeding it or is actively protecting it. I, I want to read out a quote where um, Alexander talks about how he's been researching it and he says, I looked and every time I got close, I had wild spirits on my doorstep or goblin problems or pointed fingers jabbing through the metaphorical peepholes trying to gouge out my eye, which n- needs more explanation, right? Like, <laughs> what that means is there are others that are protecting the hungry choir. Is this the Kennet others? Is this something else? Is this just kind of karma or it's made deals to protect itself? Whatever it is, though, the fact that that it's not just an isolated thing, that it's got a, a team, there's a team hungry choir that exists, mm. That's that makes me nervous. Yeah, yeah, and because we'd sort of had discussions and been a bit confused about the exact sort of origins of it. Yes. Um, And and so basically it does seem like naturally these things change a bit more and grow slower, and and the the Hungry Choir has popped up insanely quickly. Um, Nine years ago, already seemingly at the level of power that it is now, which is crazy. Right. Yes, and also very similar to how it is now, which sort of makes it more powerful because it's a more entrenched pattern rather than one that has changed and adapted. Yes. Um, yes. And, and you know, like we sort of talked about, it continuously grows in power because it's it's sucking up these people, and much like the um, you know singing shows it's based on turns them into zombies. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the nature of how it is like affiliated with a bunch of ghost towns and also Kennet it's just kind of like okay i'm lumping this right next to who killed the carmine beast as like a big thing in fact like i will be very surprised if those two things are unrelated yes i i think um you know we'll talk about pale predictor a little bit later when we dive into some predictions but i think a prediction category we're about to start seeing a lot more of is what the fuck's going on with the hungry choir yeah yeah like we will open it up as a new category but like again i'm going to be shocked if it's like Oh, uh, these three made the hungry choir, but these other three, they did the Carmine Beast thing. Like, yeah, it's all probably part of the same shebang. Yeah. Um, we'll have to see. I don't know. Maybe it's, uh, you know, the first is the case of the hungry choir and second is, uh, you know, the Kennet trio in the case of the Carmine Beast. <laughs> we'll have to see. Um, so yes, uh, Alexander accepts the enrollment of the trio to his school means they're they're now attending not hogwarts which will be fun uh, and with that he steps back effectively leaving nicolette to them don't go to this school they've please. made the deal they've made the deal already it's too late Elliot. no they said they have intent sure yes. um they can change their minds and i like i, like, I just oh, yeah i mean yeah uh, we, we, we've we'll, been through this like yeah. they, it's, it, there's no good reason to go it's really bad place to be yeah um so yeah, uh, Nicolette puts up a bit of a show, but really is in no position to argue, right? Because it's mm-hmm. Kenneth and the trio versus Nicolette, and Nicolette really doesn't have Alexander to back her up. Like, even, no. in fact, Alexander is more 
seeking to gain from her misfortune than anything. <laughs> she she really doesn't stand a chance. Yeah, and we could have kind of seen that coming in retrospect like with the way 2.z ended. Um, mm. This is sort of what he was going for. But yeah, he really just sort of tosses her to the wolves. Um, again, like she just must be fuming about the way this all went down. She's kind of been betrayed by Alexander. Um, these three are getting more power, free tuition. They're taking stuff out on her, which I, as she keeps pointing out, all she did was steal a couple of ghosts, which is not great, obviously, but, um, <laughs> yeah, like she, she did also get Melissa, uh, yeah, get, um, Melissa's leg or foot broken. Yeah. But- oh, as she says, there, there may have been. She may have only, you know, given that a nudge, like it may have already yeah. been coming to some extent. But yeah, yeah, I mean, like that's the thing. Like she's, you know, her her, her hands aren't clean, um, but mm. she really gets fucked over with all this, and it's well, just like because she she, thing- she has to have a relationship with the Kenneteers now. Like they they set up this thing where yes. she's going to bring them ghosts, and there's going to be an ongoing relationship between these three and uh, Nicolette. And I just at the moment I can't see. Anyway, for that not to be extremely antagonistic for a long time. Yes, I think there's no way it won't be. There's this moment where Verona reveals that she's erased Nicolette's schedule. And the fact that we saw what this means to Nicolette in Mm. 2.Z really, really helped sell this moment. um, Because it's so dirty and I loved it. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah. On the note of, um, you know, how Verona found a really good use for her pen gift... Um, mm. all of the Miss gifts are kind of very important for this interaction, right? Like Almost like Miss wanted this exact thing <laughs> yeah, put, put on your tinfoil hats, people. Um, yeah. no, but, like, you know, so there's the pen. Uh, the school enrollment info is obviously pretty key. Um, I mean, Avery's technically even using her forest ribbon trail gift right now. Um, mm-hmm. Lucy's weapon ring is is really the only one that doesn't specifically come up she, in this. She puts it on. Uh, for the, she, yeah, exactly. She, she has she puts it. it on. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you're right. Interesting. I, I, I like it as a bit of a. More. It, even if it, like, even if it's not, you know, oh, like this big sort of, you know, Machiavellian scheme by yeah. Miss or whatever. I like it as a yeah. bit of a send off to her that they're using what she gave them to yeah. get a bit of revenge. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, I, yeah. Nicolette really doesn't have a leg to stand on and she basically has to just do exactly what they say. Um, I I think she gets off relatively easy given how much of an instigator she was in this situation. I mean, she was doing it at Alexander's request, so it sucks that he really gets off scot-free, but, um, yeah. you know, whatever. Well, she basically gets off at the cost of um, presumably a short and unpleasant trip to the Forest Ribbon Trail. and yep. One day for Alexander. Yeah, which is like, you know, she she gave him four weeks for the ability to visit the Forest Ribbon Trail through the dollhouse. So yeah. relatively not a not a huge cost. Um, but yeah, she, she comes out of this feeling like the loser. She's the one who's having to pay for things more than anyone else. Yeah. Um Yep. But that's what happens when you're the apprentice to a dickhead, you bear, bear the cost. Yep. Um so yes, Nicolette agrees to take Avery's place as, as soon as she can, and she does. It takes a few hours, but Avery gets out, and the trio is reunited. And Avery quickly cements her position as everyone's favourite. <laughs> oh, it's it's so nice how there's just a section break, and then you have Snowdrop come in and be like, she's gone. And I was like, oh, thank Christ. Like, <laughs> yep. And it's such a way, yes. like, just, Snowdrop is just so fun as a device. Like. <laughs> Maybe I'm juvenile, but this this idea of her always saying the exact opposite of what she means is just fun. <laughs> it is fun, isn't it? It's good. Um, so, yes, we've reached the end of the Forest Ribbon Trail saga, right? Um, mm-hmm. And there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, the first thing I think to touch on is it really does seem like Miss is gone from this story, now, right? Like, we get a bit of a send-off to Miss with Avery saying, yeah, I, I had some last interactions with Miss before Nicolette swapped me out. And, yeah. She's gone. It's sad. And we'll see. It's almost certainly going to shake up the dynamic of Kennet in a way that is not good. Yes. Miss was the sort of leader and, and stabilizer of this place. And uh, she was a very smart cookie. So um, it's bad that she's gone. I, I will be interested. She she definitely seemed under the impression that she, you know, might be able to get out at some point. But, you know, with someone like Miss, she might be thinking, mm. oh, 500 years from now, I'll get out. It's fine. Um, mm. 
it would be interesting to see her again um, from the perspective of a- as a lost, you know, when she sort of takes form when a finder comes, she she gets a lot of her form from that finder. And I, like, we yeah. don't really understand, like, does what does she lose when she is like, you know, between people summoning her or whatever. So it's, it's like if there was a miss that came back in a couple of months, what how much would she resemble what, like the person we just lost mm, true i mean she might not even be female anymore maybe that was she was found by a female finder and that exactly was it. like yeah, there's definitely there would be uh, yeah like we, we have no idea how big the changes would be what she may or may not remember um i think it'd be fascinating to sort of see like i yeah i mean because like, there'd be a lot to read into about sort of what what the story wants to do with her when that when that's happening mm. like if, if we're sort of sticking with our whole like mystery novel justice metaphor type stuff she's almost like i don't know, like a fugitive or an unregistered mm. person or something mm. so you know it could tie into all that stuff so I, I don't know i'm sort of really just coming up with this I, I i don't know how it could work but you know there'd be something to draw from there that could be really cool yeah i i think we might get more of her at the conclusion of this narrative when we have the you know the parlor room scene where lucy's pointing out who did what in the murder of the carmine (laughs) miss might come back for that i can kind of see that happening but i I don't see her coming back until then or an epilogue it could be fun if the last epilogue chapter is miss like 500 years in the future she comes back (laughs) yeah i i'm a little surprised that the trio doesn't see retrieving miss as something within their wheelhouse (laughs) I would have liked to think that would be high up on Avery's priority list as a finder. Yeah. Being like, like trying to find another path that like one of the rewards, because I assume she can't go back to the forest ribbon trail. I assume she probably doesn't yes. want to. Um, well, and if you don't, if you get out in a way that isn't, uh, wait, no. So I guess the way she got out was basically by swapping out her boon companion in air quotes. It's just that Nicolette took that place. I mean, instead. Is it like I have no fucking clue anymore? Like it's it's such a mess. I I like there's probably a dozen yeah. interpretations that you could make. She didn't get out with the detour at least, and the detour was the one that said you can't come back if you take the detour. Right. So theoretically, she could go back. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't know how it works. <laughs> the one person who did know was Miss, and so exactly. they can't really ask her anymore, can they? Um, but like I, I guess the point is, is like I think one of the forest ribbon things is like you get to take a lost other out with you. Maybe if they can find another path where there's like a boon like that, you go in and you try and get miss out. Like, you know, I don't know if it has to be one of the ones that's in there with you or whatever, but um, yeah, yeah I, I agree. Like, I think that that is something they could do. Maybe that would be like an epilogue chapter is them saving miss. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think the other thing here is, so I, when Avery comes back, she's got this little rope that lets her, um, you know, do like cool teleporting stuff. Um, yeah. And uh, Dev on our Discord pointed out something that a couple of people had noticed, which was the rope was one of the things you could take if you did the detour. Um, yes. So this is presumably the rope Miss took when she escaped the Forest Ribbon Trail. Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, just nice and sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <sighs> I wonder um, if the ring and the feather are also things Miss picked up in her travel no paths. Detour things. They could be. Because she said she went I mean, through a bunch of different paths. Maybe she yeah. nicked them from the guy who bound her. Mm, mm, maybe. Maybe. Maybe we'll find out. Um, so the other thing that is worth noting as we reach the end of 3.2 is while Avery was away, this was the real t- first the first real time that we saw the trio properly split up and acting without all three of them. And, you know, we were discussing whether they'd be in danger or whether this would go badly, but they really did fine. They did well, right? Um, and I'm I'm kind of trying to reconcile that. And I think what it means is the fact that the fact that they were trying to get Avery back. I mean, like, we know that the fact they're waking together means that there's this kind of pull that ties them together. So potentially the fact that they were trying to get Avery back actually gave them some kind of like karmic advantage in those situations because that's what they were they were they were kind of operating in the will of the universe trying to keep them connected, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's interesting because we've talked a lot about how the best tactic for fighting them is splitting them up. But if they've, like, we've kind of seen how effective they are at undoing that. So it's it's a good and sign. Back together, yeah. Um, I I think the last thing I want to touch on before we move on to the next chapter is 
basically, so the, the three meet up and they meet Avery and they have a quick chat and they're like, oh, what do you want to do? And Avery's like, I think I just want to be alone. And that's who mm. jumped out to me because that is not that's the Avery the we met. what Avery wants usually, yeah. Yeah, t- two weeks ago, uh, Avery, because that's how long this story's taken. Um, <laughs> like, that would not have been her, I don't think. Um, so there's a real sense of growth. And she talks about how yeah. she puts the memories of being someone who toughed this out. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm choosing to read this as a good sign. Like, you know, so much relationship advice type stuff is always, you know, um, you need to be okay, like with yourself before you make mm. a good partner for someone. And yeah. I sort of see that being Avery now. Like, she's not someone who needs to have someone around her. She's kind of, oh, I need to go process, process this by myself. And that's usually the sort of thing that is the first step to being you know, someone who should be in a healthy relationship. So, I, I, yeah, I might, you know, this was obviously a traumatic experience, but we're about to dive into her head and I've sort of come out of it thinking, okay, like, you know, this could have gone worse. Yeah, I guess that's a, a good metric. Yeah, it does feel like there's been some growth for her, for sure, um, which is nice. Uh, so that's the end of 3.2. Next, we jump into Out on a Limb 3.3. We're in Avery's head and she's back and she's probably fine. Um <laughs> Yeah, I I love the way this chapter starts with Kerry's cackle ran through the house, which is right back into Avery's head, right back into the level of anxiety and chaos that exists in the Kelly household. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Kerry cackling in the house, Forest Ribbon Trail, about equal in terms of stress, I think. (laughs) Well, I think it's like a very, like the the use of the word cackle there. Yes. uh, You're right. It instantly sort of puts you in like a bit of anxiety and mm. particularly you know avery the day after you know spending a, a day trapped in the forest ribbon trail like that is yep. just the mindset she's in and a- again it's that opening line that strongly puts you where you need to be yeah definitely um really gets you right back in um i, I love the idea of countermeasures it's very fun <laughs> These parents kind of sanction warfare on their own children if they're not up in time for school, which is great. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's an interesting strategy, isn't it? It's um, like, you know, we, we talk a lot about like justice and stuff in this story. It's, mm-hmm. it's this weird example of like letting citizens police each other. Um, yeah, it, it, it feels kind of, a bit Stanford prison experiment, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, like you can kind of see how for two busy parents they kind of need to contract out justice like this because there's so much going on they can't they they don't have time they don't exactly and as as avery comes down says we see that they're already like chaotically struggling to plan out all the things that they need to do for the day while managing this morning rush and it doesn't seem like that's an out of the out of the ordinary situation for them no this this seems like a fairly regular morning except for the fact that avery's not awake um but yeah, so it's kind of like I, I can sort of see why this is what has happened because I, I don't know what else they're really meant to do. But it also doesn't feel like a great solution because there's no way this sort of behavior isn't like exacerbating sort of rifts between the siblings. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So throughout this chapter, we really do get a thread of Avery being pretty, pretty disconnected here, right? Like, obviously, this is understandable, but it also does seem a little dangerous she exhibits some pretty casual power usage with uh, using her jump rope outside the bathroom to just kind of skip in um i don't know I, not a problem but just you know something to keep an eye on <laughs> yeah like i'm sort of again like you know to use lucy's terminology i'm willing to give her a bit of a pass here because she just went through the forest ribbon trail she's like spiritually drained I can't tell how much of that is the trauma and how much of it is like the magic yeah. or you yeah. know, it's both. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, you know, there was that sense of like the forest ribbon trail, you get out of it and you're just kind of half dead for a couple of days. And you, you really yeah. feel that now, like she's just so spiritually exhausted. And I think that's part of why yeah. she's just like, she's just using this thing. Cause she just needs to get into that bathroom and deal with her shit. And she's not going to yeah. stand there and wait for Declan to go. Yep. She's just going to, you know, muscle on in, which is great. Um, it, I was worried for a moment that it felt like Avery was going to get kind of lost again in the chaos of the house, if you'll pun the word, I guess. Um, but on reading through the chapter a little more closely, it, it, I don't think that that's the case. It, we have these little interactions like where uh, Avery doesn't eat a sausage. She just grabs a muffin instead because she's having some weird relationships with meat which is fair given all that's happened in this story with yep. the hungry choir and the wolf um 
But after hap- this happens, without anyone really bringing attention to it, Sheridan notices and Rowan notices, and they kind of have a little bit of no, they don't even pick on her. It's just kind of like a little banter, right? Um, very, very like neutral to positive level of sibling interactions, which is nice. It, it seems like um, I don't know if would, I would go this far to say that they fully like notice that she's not doing well and are keeping an eye on her, but they are keeping an eye on her at least somewhat, um, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah, Sheridan's supportive in the same way Snowdrop's words are supportive. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, yeah, you're right. Sheridan notices, which is something, and, and she sort of calls it out. Um, so, you know, maybe deep down she cares. Although there's the bit later where she's like overreact much or it's like, oh, real helpful, Sheridan. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, like even that bit up with Declan where she just kind of pushes in, that doesn't feel like something slipping under the radar Avery would have done. Um, yeah. I had the same reaction as you. The first time I read this chapter, I started to become worried she was in this tired state, going to slip through the cracks. But yeah. the more I read it, the more I was actually like, oh, no, I think she's actually like kind of having the opposite happen right here. Um, yeah. There's a bit of a sense of like, oh, she's almost getting too noticed. She doesn't want <laughs> well, that right now. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's a weird reversal, isn't it? Um, first, the... Yeah, well, I guess just in general, the kind of wanting to be alone is not mm. a thing that we've seen that much of Avery. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's also, like, in this whole kitchen scene, there's this bit where the parents are sort of, as you already touched on, like, negotiating how they're going to get through all the shit they have to get done today. Um, mm-hmm. And, like, so Rowan gets involved because Rowan's like, oh, I want to borrow, borrow the car. Um, yes. And they're like, yeah, I mean, you can if you do X, Y, and Z. Um, and there's this, you know, real 18-year-old, sort of comment where he's like i thought getting the car was meant to mean i have more freedom but i gotta do all this shit i've only got like half the time to meet and it was just like welcome to adulting yeah um, welcome to the real world man. The, the more freedom you have the less you have um it, but it, like again it, it's, it's contributing to this idea of like how overworked the kellys are like they're sort of you know contracting out th- this stuff to their 18 year old son which is actually like a very normal and in my opinion much more reasonable way to go about outsourcing yes. this sort of stuff yep as opposed uh, to letting kelly drench Avery. as opposed to warfare yeah uh, <laughs> oh, sorry what they call it countermeasures yeah um yeah so avery kind of tiptoes her way through breakfast before heading off to chat to drop and pop so it's funny when i first read that in the notes i thought drop and pop was some sort of dark joke you're making about grumble what would that even mean i don't know like pop pops the thing for like punching someone oh, yeah, out for your grandfather oh Sure, or that. Uh, yeah, and that. So, yeah, I, I was like, wow, this is like a weird dark joke. And then, like, I got further through the notes. I was like, oh, he means Snowdrop no, and Cherry Pop. Obviously, Snowdrop and Cherry Pop. <laughs> Drop and Pop, the dream team. Oh, yeah, this probably says more about me than it does about your joke. But, yeah, just in case anyone yeah. else is as stupid as I am. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, well, speaking of Grumble, there is this moment in this chapter that we should touch on where Avery basically has a bit of a... Of, of a triggered moment right she has this kind of flashback or well no i don't it's not quite a flashback she, but she's definitely triggered in, in the ptsd yeah. sense by by what by just having a, a momentary flashback and grumble kind of raising his his hand she like i mean she draws illusions like uh, well, oh, so, no like she she knows there's a similarity like you know there's a, a yeah. raised wrinkled hand like that that was sort of the form the wolf had taken yes. um it, it's very like a loud rough old person words being said um like it just it just takes her back there basically yeah um which is bad i mean i hope avery's relationship with grumble has been a kind of a a point of pride for her and so i hope this isn't impacted or impacted too harshly i guess yeah yeah we'll um we'll see i mean she definitely she comments on it later how there was it put a bit of a dent in it um we'll see how permanent that is but yeah, yeah, this is um, the moment I thought you were referencing with drop and with drop and pop. pop. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> In lighter news, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think we were all pretty excited to see how drop and pop would interact together, and it yeah. is really great to see. Um, Cherry pop just doesn't understand <laughs> Snowdrop's lying, and it just makes every moment so great with their interactions. Yeah, they they're f- f- fucking fantastic together. It's so good. Um, I love. Like so, Cherry Pop leaves the scene to go and steal some flavored milk because she thinks that's going to torture Snowdrop. Um, <laughs> and all Snowdrop's sarcastic responses are hilarious. Uh, I almost want to read an interlude 
that is just cherry pop, like this tiny goblin's epic journey to steal some milk from a convenience store because it's probably super hard for her. Like it feels like something that would be out of like Toy Story, like because she's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like what she's like four inches tall, right? So she's yep. got to fucking Toy Story her way into the convenience store to get milk. Like I'd, I'd <laughs> read or watch the shit out of that. Yeah, it does sound good, doesn't it? Um, I also, I mean, to, to go back to sort of Snowdrop, like she's so good for Avery. Like, like mm. Avery sort of directly comments on how much she kind of gets rejuvenated by helping Snowdrop. And it's like she was barely able to get out of bed and eat breakfast. And after like a two-minute chat with Snowdrop, she's able to cycle them both to school. Yeah, like, you're right. It is it is a good marker for the fact that she is kind of rejuvenated by helping and being around other people. Yeah, and Snowdrop is just so wholesome in her own uniquely unwholesome uh, uh, face value way. Yeah, it's interesting. I I sus- I guess it's that kind of thing that Avery had on the on the Forest Ribbon Trail where she had this moment of like not second guessing herself, and then Snowdrop's you know Snowdrop's thing of being supportive through you know second guessing you or supportive through putting you down i guess kind of plays into that where it seems like avery isn't you know when when snow drop says for example that avery is being a baby when she first comes back from the forest ribbon trail there's not a moment of wait is she is she right am i it's very much no like i want to i wish i could but i know what you're telling me is actually that i'm being strong yeah it's very it's interesting in how well she's able to take it as reinforcement yeah exactly like it, it's a testament to how strong the bond kind of is between these two already avery's much better at understanding snowdrop than i am i it still takes me a minute half the time um yeah, yeah. i always have the instinctive you what oh, oh no wait you're snowdrop yeah yeah cool. yeah <laughs> it's, um, it's such a good way like just as a device i think it's so useful to like like in this world where all the practitioners and the others have to tell the truth um i stop questioning what people are saying um and i think it's like a fun way to kind of break us a bit out of that it's probably also fun mm. for wild Bo to get to <laughs> write the opposite of it but um yeah. yeah yeah um cool so uh avery meets up with the rest of the trio uh and they head to school before uh after they send snowdrop to kind of spy on the kennet others and see what they're up to yeah, and so my question here is, what do, like, muggles see mm. when, like, where Snowdrop is? Like, like what what do the other kids see when the three Kenneteers are kind of interacting with Snowdrop here? Do they see her in baby possum form? Do they see a little girl in ragged clothes with missing teeth? Do they see nothing? Like, what? Good I'm very question. confused about this. Yes, I don't know. We haven't seen Snowdrop interact with any muggles yet, so... For all we know, they could just not see her at all. Um, but we'll see, I guess. Um, hmm. When they're at school, we have this moment where Avery, I'm just going to call it, washes her face with glamour, um, which is understandable, obviously. But again, it's another casual magic use that is hopefully not becoming a pattern. I, someone, I think there was a comment in the, the Reddit discussion on this chapter that I really liked, which was kind of likening this to like going to the bathroom and smoking a cigarette or something like that, <laughs> that you would see in a, in a, you know, American high school movie with the bad kids starting or the kids starting to fall with the bad crowd. And, you know, she goes to the bathroom to, to smoke right. a cigarette or whatever during class. I mean, the little um, connection I made is it was like, you know how, like, like part of the reason you, you dress yourself up and you, you would do something like put on makeup is to portray like a, a, a better and more confident version of yourself. Yeah. And this is, like Avery's literally doing that. She's putting on magical makeup that literally makes her more confident. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I just, again, I hope she doesn't get too reliant on it. I guess. Well, I mean, that's you could see how that would become addictive very quickly. Like if it wears off and she suddenly played with indecision again, she'd be running to Guillaume and being like, hit me up with some of that confidence glamour, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, like again, willing to give her a pass for this one, you know, yep. right after a traumatic she gets event. The pass, yeah. Uh, but like, you know, keeping an eye on this becoming a pattern. Yeah. Um. So uh, there's this interesting transition where they're kind of as they as they uh, finish up this scene with the three of them at school, they're talking to Avery about what she wants to do, and she says, "I want to get moving, run." And then there's a dash, a section break, and the next and then the next section starts with. She moved, running, 
And it's this very abrupt and and obviously quite fun transition, but the abruptness of it really like, again, you know, we're in Avery's head, she's on edge, she's feeling less safe. And these abrupt transitions are a great way to just kind of not let us get too comfortable while we're reading. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, it keeps you on edge, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. Not for any, there's, you know, there's nothing bad that's about to happen or anything, but just to just to not let you get too relaxed, not let you get too out of Avery's kind of state. Yeah, and and, and this also ties into the end of the chapter. Like, I suppose I'll talk about it more there, but like her, her whole sort of way of thinking in regards to why she wants to keep moving, why she wants, because this decision she makes right here in this section break is she wants to dive further into the practice rather than take a break yeah. from it, like Lucy suggests. She basically has Lucy and Verona as like a devil and angel on her shoulder, like, do you want to do more <laughs> practice or less practice? Um, yeah. And she chooses more, and I guess we'll see how that goes. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the fact that she makes this decision right after putting on that glamour yeah. is just sort of, again, just a little bit like, okay, yeah. like I'm going to let it slide this time, but I'm a little concerned. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so the trio heads to Matthew and Edith's place to spy on a kind of secret gathering of Kenneth others that has been taking place. Yeah. And so before we get to that whole mess, like, can we talk about how they get there? Because it's fucking, it's like a scene straight out of the Avengers or something where yeah. Avery's fucking zip zapping around town using her cool yeah. rope powers. Meanwhile, you know, the rest of the team is flying around in bird form. Um, yeah, Verona and awesome. Lucy are full on animorphing now. Like <laughs> Verona goes from cat to uh, sorry, from bird to cat, just kind of flipping around in 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 sh- in different animal forms. Like they're in they're in the zone. <laughs> yes, um, I, and I mean the Verona bit again concerns me with regards to how on par with the face she is. Like she just you know she's had she's had this glamour for a couple of days, and she's seamlessly transitioning from bird to cat. Um, She's concerningly good with this stuff. It has me worried. Um, yeah. But yeah, like this is one of those moments where now I'm just constantly coming back to the I'm like, no wonder Nicolette's pissed. Like these three are, you, you know, a week and a half in and they've already got these abilities to fucking dash around and turn into birds and stuff. Um, it's insane. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So Snowdrop gives us a rundown of what happened here and, it's hard to understand. It's really hard to keep track of, but we people on Reddit posted Snowdrop translations, and Wabo himself kind of realised, I think, that it was a bit difficult because he also posted a Snowdrop translation in the bonus materials. Basically, it looks like the Kenna others were doing a bit of planning and discussing, mostly around Matthew and Edith. Um, Riska and Charles were here too, and they've uh, picked a new leader, which we find out is kind of Matthew and Edith together being the de facto leaders of the Kenna others. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think to, to go back to what you said, uh, like towards the side of that, I think that's what's really fun about this extra material is while Bo can leave uh, like a challenge like that, like I agree, I sort of read Snowdrop stuff and I was like, okay, my brain just melted. Um, hopefully somebody else has done this. And I think what's fun is now while Bo doesn't have to rely on just expositing it to us later in dialogue or relying on you having to know to search the reddit threads he can just chuck it in the extra material as a kind of okay yeah. like i got to include this and it was fun but i am going to give you the answer like a bit later so it rewards people yeah. who want to do it but also you know eventually then the rest of us get to catch up yeah it lets people catch up in a way that's comfortable with their level of comprehension which is quite nice yeah, because otherwise, like, without the extra material, the, like, the only other way to actually give us that info would have been to have the three kind of have this clunky conversation where you have to be like, yes, so we decoded Snowdrop stuff and, and you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's so much easier to just be like, these are Avery's notes on it. Yeah. Read it if you want, skim it if you want. You, don't, you know, you don't have to. It's yeah. just kind of there. Um, um, oh, y- yes. oh, sorry. <laughs> so then this chapter ends basically with Avery... Uh, considering whether she would like to continue down the path of becoming a finder. Yeah, it's a really nice conclusion to this sort of arc that Avery has gone through. Like, like you know, there, there's sort of this this conclusion to this little arc in this chapter, and it sort of goes all the way through. Um, and she sort of summarizes it here at the end: is like the world is scary. I can't like hide from that. I can't fly yeah. under the radar at this point. Um, you know, she's kind of, she's tried that before. Uh, what she needs to do is kind of keep trying to move forward and, you know, find the diamonds in the rough. Yeah. Uh, the the sentiment that this chapter ends on is 
uh, Avery thinks Avery could see herself continuing to look for the snowdrops that sprung up in the scary place, which is just a beautiful sentiment. Like it's a scary world. The paths are scary, but there are, there are snowdrops out there to be found. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Like it is, it is just such a nice sentiment. And it's why it's funny. Cause I think so many times usually when a chapter ends with, yes, we're going to do another practice. Um, like I'm always like, oh God, no, no. Oh God. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. is the first one where I'm sort of like, okay, this feels like a healthy like version of it to me. I mean, it's obviously not yeah. great. Like the paths aren't like, you know, playgrounds, but I couldn't help but be like, okay, like I can, I can see this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's the end of 3.2. Uh, 3.3. Oh, sorry. 3.3. 3. <laughs> <laughs> Just keeping you on your toes earlier. Um, so yes, then we get to our extra material, Timelines, which starts with Avery and her doodles guiding us through <laughs> what has happened this month and what's happening later in the month. I mean, I think this is the perfect time for this because I think I was just reaching the point where I was like, I'm going to have to go back and read Arc 1 because I don't remember exactly how long ago things mm. were. Um, mm. So just having the ability to just have the author be like here's a quick here's a calendar guide. of what has happened yeah <laughs> um it's it's so great rather than having to rely on the community or, or yourself to do it um mm. and again like I, I think the thing that always shines through in these extra material stuff are like little details like there's the doodles but there's also um because it's avery the only project due dates that are listed <laughs> are yes. the miss hardy ones <laughs> miss hardy's projects yeah like you could just like you just know it's avery because she's like i don't give a fuck about my other classes gotta make sure i impress miss miss hardy though yeah god it was good um i love the doodles there's these little spirit doodles for, for the procession of spirits that came to the, the to the meeting and one of them is literally just a penis <laughs> like <laughs> avery's just literally kind of let her mind run away with random doodles of miscellaneous things they're yeah, so I, good. I love them all. These doodles are fantastic. I love the snowdrop one so much. Yeah. Um, I'm, I think I, I think I'm going to make it my Discord avoca- avatar. Mm. Um, there's also <laughs> there's the little one uh, where we get to like the sort of four people who start this this sort of meeting, and yeah. there's like a it's mat the doom, and doom 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 yeah, and, yeah. and Edith is a little candle woman holding his yeah. hand. Like it's adorable. Oh. So good. Like Walbo's yeah. defined such an like an adorable little style here. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, we get these little tidbits of what's coming up as well. There's an interesting one which is um I think it's something like Verona has some mum stuff to deal with at the end of the month or something, which who knows what that means. Yeah, like I think I think what's great about this calendar is it doesn't just sort of tell us the the 12 days that we've gone through um or, or and like remind us on that which is helpful it kind of gives you this sense of what we need to be looking forward towards um and like on what scale like there's like the rest of this month and there's you know all the hungry choir dates are listed and where they're happening and i think like the really important thing about that is what i noticed having this all laid out in front of us like this is all the biggest events and nights have centered around hungry choir uh, ritual nights well uh, maybe that's intentional right if we've we've touched on the idea that somebody has created the yeah. hungry choir the nights that the hungry choir has been active are potentially intentionally distractions from other things that are happening oh yeah i definitely thought the same thing i was like you know it's hard to know how much could be cause and effect or whatever but i was sort of like okay so they awoke on a hungry choir night and then the next one was like 1.z the one after that was the end of arc two it's sort of like each arc has ended on this big moment that has ta- been tangentially related at least to the Hungry Choir. Um, mm. So having them all marked out like that, I sort of start to be like, okay, so these are maybe when we should start to expect big events to, to be happening for whatever reason. Um, yeah. And then as you mentioned, there's stuff like uh, in June we'll have like other projects and we've got to go to our uh, fancy magical summer school that please don't go to. Um, yeah, like I, I think it's fun to sort of, also prime us for how far thought how far forward we need to be thinking yeah definitely um in this note in these notes we also get a bit of a snowdrop translation of what happened at the meeting which we've already mostly covered i don't think there's anything else in here that is new information or crazy information i i mean i I think the bit that starts to, to jump out to me is like the meeting started with this foursome and i mean it's it's directly brought up like as a question like why these four why these who's four? charles yeah. Marissa Carr, uh, Matthew and Edith. So there's there's really like 
the story seems to be pointing us in a bit of a keep your eye on these four uh, yeah, direction. Marissica is the odd one out in that group, right? Like, yeah, the other three are the sort of human adjacent others. Um, and Marissica is kind of explicitly the opposite. She's trying her hardest not to be human. Yeah, strange. Um, but then the end of this bonus material has Avery laying out the timeline of the story as we know it so far, which is a great little bit just to kind of sum up all the outstanding loose ends, right? So, for example, I'd completely forgotten that Guillaume mentioned having his own secret scheme that was unrelated to the Carmine Beast, but, <laughs> you know, he's just off meeting with someone that we don't know. Like, I don't know what that means, but I'd forgotten it. And Wildbo's just kind of saying, hey, this might be important, so don't forget it. I I no, mostly problem. read this as proof that I was right, that the flashback scene 10 to 10 years ago or whatever is, is hugely important when John killed the the black dog and, and who was mm. around them. Like, I think there's still mystery to me surrounding the nature of Kennet, like how it came to be this haven for others, how exactly that haven works. Like, we're, we're, you know, th- there was seemingly some sort of agreement to transfer leadership to Matthew and Eve, like how de facto is that? What are the rules and the contracts surrounding this commune? And I, I'm beginning to suspect that like the fact that we haven't got answers on that at this point, I'm like, okay, does it tie into, you know, the Hungry Choir and or the Carmine Beast mystery? Like it, you know, and, and our snippets at the past when that stuff was forming, I think is going to be crucial for us understanding it. Yeah, definitely. Um, but we don't have those answers yet, Elliot. Maybe next time. Um so that's the end of the, the chapters that we're discussing today. But don't go away yet, because we've got a bunch more content to go, to get through. First of all, I guess we'll dive into Pale Predictor. Some Pale Predictor predictions, shall we? Yes. Uh, so what have you brought this week? I brought a prediction from a user called Chromester, uh, who said that uh, Guillaume talked to, in this secret meeting, the person who created the Hungry Choir the night that the Carmine Beast died. So yeah, I we kind of touched on this already, but... We're definitely kind of focusing in this now on where the Hungry Choir came from and what's going on. So I'm excited to to dive into more theories. And I like this one, the idea of this secret person that Guillaume spoke to being the uh, being tied to who created the Hungry Choir. I like it. Tie all these loose threads together. Why not? So I, I've just had a thought now. So the, Ooh, live theory. <laughs> yeah. So sorry for how malformed this might be. Okay. So it was 10-ish years ago that John killed the black dog. Yep, and nine years ago that yeah. the Hungry Choir was created. So there is some overlap there. Well, because something something that came up, right, with John is that you can't really kill him because he's powered by the war that he was a part of. Like, it's very difficult. Ooh, I see. What if, yeah. what if the Hungry Choir is... I, I black forgot dog. her name. But, like, what I if like that was a whole her. thing? What if? What if they weren't killing her but they were transferring or transforming her i don't know what if the hungry choir is her to some degree and maybe that's why it's mostly children or i don't know well uh, interesting interesting yeah okay i can see that what about i mean the other thing we don't necessarily know that much about is where the carmine beast came from, right yeah i got the impression it's been in power for hundreds of years to the point where that may not be relevant but i don't know why i assumed that it could have yeah. only been in power for 10 to 20 years. I wouldn't know. Yeah. Just the fact that we're questioning the origins of some of these others is making me, you know, start to question the Carmine Beasts one more. Like, because we know where Matthew and Edith came from. We know where Miss came from. I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway. Another thread. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> what prediction did you pull out for us to talk about? <laughs> um, so I pulled out one from, oh God, I didn't try to figure out how to pronounce this username before uh may he may jaho sorry um who you know again is is also on the who created the hungry choir thing i think we're just gonna have to make this a new category um i i need to go clean up pale predictor a bit in fact because i haven't even closed the what is miss category which just doesn't need to be there anymore um so i think i'll replace it with the who created the hungry choir uh category Mm. Comment mm. in the Reddit thread if you have any other categories you think the Power Predictor needs. Um, yeah. But anyway, I so uh, Meiji Hao uh, has basically suggested that they think the choir was created by the Kenner others collectively using knowledge that they got from Charles because Charles was, you know, forsworn about a decade ago and mm. um, the others 
like Charles specialized in creating others. So mm. they're like, maybe this was part of the deal. Like Charles helped them create the hungry choir and they tap power from it or something. Um, m- might be related to Matthew's doom is something that's brought up, but, um, yeah, you know, basically tying into the whole idea that the Hungry Choir might actually be a tool of this commune and, you know, I guess in theory then part of the power source of the Kenneteers. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I like it. I uh, love uh, these uh, who created the Hungry Choir theories. Yes. Uh, the other thing uh, Meiji how tied it to is the death of the Carmine Beast, suggesting that maybe if the Carmine Beast found out about Hungry Choir being created deliberately by a Kennet, um, she might have been obligated to try and do something about it and they managed, mm. it had grown so powerful that they were able to kill her or like it could have been the Hungry Choir acting in self-defense even. Yeah, I could see it. I am i don't, this is the thing with the Hungry Choir, right, is the question that comes up is who benefits from it? And I don't think anyone does right now. <laughs> like, Well, I think that's what yeah. I like about this this theory here is that there's an idea that the Kennet others are getting power from it and protection, presumably, mm. uh, if it is a tool of theirs. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can see it. So just add on just add on my fresh new layer of unthought out theory that um, it was created from uh, John's black from dog. Black dog. Yeah. Uh, and I think we've cracked the case. There we go. Solved the mystery. Yeah. Um, all right, so if you want to leave your uh, own predictions about where the Hungry Choir came from, you can check out the Pale Predictor uh, sheet in the links in the show notes. Uh, yes, and uh, we also have been running a discussion question, so mm-hmm. let's, uh, let's talk about that one. Yeah, so the question was, now that we've seen some other practitioners, do you think the Kennedy has got a good or bad deal in how they've awoken? Um, Basically, everyone said yes. Everyone said good, <laughs> yes. Everyone said a great deal. And uh, like... I think the timelines really helped solidify this. So, for example, Hero of Old Iron in the thread touched on the fact that our trio have been awakened for 1.5 weeks. And, you know, compared to Nicolette, who's, you know, a few months maybe in or six months, I don't know, and also has been like actively tutored by a school, it's like they completely steamrolled, right? Like they, mm-hmm. they're completely on a whole nother level, on a level that was baffling to her. And she was. Obviously, no slouch. So they they've got a good deal. Is is the the gist? Yeah. Um. I I, I mean, I think Hero of Old Iron also brought up with sort of this without tuition, which isn't maybe technically true because they they are getting tuition from the well, others. Yeah, true. Um. But like it's 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 less structured for sure. And you know, like their one point five weeks of lessons have in many ways caught up with Nicolette's months slash year. Uh, yeah. of of lessons so yeah a- absolutely um lendus 963 sort of directly compared it to you know things we've seen in like mile end um which was a, a packed dice game that wildbo himself ran um which we will be talking about more soon um but sort of comparing it to, to stuff like that and saying yeah these three seem to have gotten a good deal so far yeah um yeah uh, uh captain rhino also in the thread touched on yes, they've been given a leg up and, and kind of raised the question of, you know, are they leveraging this initial advantage that they've got? I, I, I was kind of uh, stumped by this one at first. Like they've clearly been given a leg up, but it's not going to last forever, right? They're in the favor with the Ken and others for now, but that's eventually going to pass, you would think. And so they need to kind of be gaining as many tools as they can now and, and gaining as much, uh, you know, permanent position as much as they can which they're kind of doing. They've got some rituals. They've got some connections. They're doing okay, I think. Yeah, I think the thing that really jumped out to me with this answer, and we did already sort of touch on this, um, like I think the the big thing Captain Rhino brings up that I think is is the best benefit the Kennedys seem to be getting so far is this breadth of uh, talent and knowledge they have access to. Um, like if you look at someone like Nicolette, yeah. I think she was well-suited to be an auger, and it's why she was chosen, but... She was brought in by August and sort of had to become an auger. And she goes to a school run by and seemingly mostly for augers. Um, the Kennedys have, you know, gotten to experiment with all sorts of shit. Avery's kind of immediately latched on to finding, but like we still don't know what Verona and Lucy might want to do. Yeah, they um, could do anything. And, and that doesn't seem like something a lot of other people get. Like if if the main way 
people are brought into this world is through families and those families specialize presumably people are basically raised to be a certain kind of pr- practitioner like yeah you know, a, a, a bell and jay doesn't probably get to choose another career they're they're brought up to be an auger they're they're sort of trained from it from birth yeah um interesting so there's a real freedom um to what these three have that a lot of other people don't get and they're getting choice we saw that with matthew as well right where he he took after his father in terms of what practitioner he was but he wasn't really digging the whole heartless vibe right like we kind of got the sense that he didn't really want to be that kind of practitioner yeah and he quickly sort of gave it up right like he and then he became um whatever it was that he was to be with edith yeah infested by whatever yeah there was a term Um, for it i I think um yeah interesting interesting um good good answers to the discussion question so thanks everyone who left in f um no discussion question this week check back next week and we'll have another one for you take a take a break this week go and read uh, sorry, go and listen to our bonus episode, two hours of more discussion on Arc 2, Stolen Away, with a very special guest. So go check that out. Yes, uh, we were joined by Jade from Octopus Literary uh, Podcast, which is a lot yep. of fun. Um, yeah, it was great. She's actually, I think, just released some of her own pale content, which I need to go and watch. Um, yep. Her packed read-through is also great if you haven't seen it. Yeah, um, but that's the end of our show for now. So thank you for joining us. Uh, if you'd like to discuss these chapters or this episode in general, you can do so by going to the discussion thread, where you'll also find Elliot's link to that comment that he mentioned by Tanky Forecast. Yes. That he definitely won't forget to post, Elliot. Yep. I uh, will try not to. It, it will probably be a couple of hours after the episode comes out, fair warning, because uh, I will be asleep by the time Ruben gets it out there, <laughs> I imagine. Um, yep. But uh, the other thing to do in there is maybe drop any suggestions for categories you'd like to see in Pale Predictor because I will spend tomorrow morning cleaning that up a bit as well. Yep. Um, if you would like to check out more of our stuff, uh, why not follow us on Twitter, at MediaMDPodcast, which <laughs> is now. our Twitter account. Yes. Um, <laughs> go follow us and you can see when we do live read or when Elliot does live reads or other miscellaneous things that are going on. Yes. Uh, and, and so you can find, um, you know, a bunch of other sh- stuff on the Doof Media Network uh, over at doofmedia.com. There's other shows. Uh, Media MD was such a show, but we've actually just finished it. So uh, yep. if you, you know, maybe this is the time that you decide you want to go take a look at what yeah, it was Now that about. it's finally finished, now that all the plot points have been resolved, <laughs> you can go back through and listen to the entire show from start to finish. So go do that. Yeah, I mean, look, we finished it because we've talked about everything worth talking about. So now mm-hmm. you can go there and see all the things that are good. Yep, if we didn't talk about it, we, by default, assume that we both hate it. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to check out other Doof content that isn't uh, by the two of us, I don't know why you would, but you can if you want, uh, you can go to doofmedia.com and check out all the great shows on there. There are lots of really great shows. Uh what you say is my eternal favorite. So I will always bug people. To that. Yes. Uh, and there's also Wildbo's patron, yes. patreon.com forward slash Wildbo. And Ruben yep. told me he had a bit for this one. So I'm going to hand it over to him. No, you're not meant to do it so clunky. I was going to segue into it naturally, Elliot. <laughs> Jeez. Why don't you do that? Do it again. We'll go for another take at it. But this time, just let me jump in, you know, au natural. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, you know, while you're thinking about Patreon, head on over to patreon.com forward slash Wildbo. Yes. Now, Elliot, I know that we all assumed that, you know, we had to pay tuition to Wabo, but actually, if you read the fine print very carefully, we don't actually have to pay him for the work that he does, but we still should because it's good. So go over to patreon.com forward slash Wabo and give him some money. Yeah. Don't be a freeloader like yeah, these Yeah, Don't Kenneteers. be a dirty freeloading Kenneteer. Pay him some tuition, goddammit. Yeah. Be like Nicolette. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's the show. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, uh, we will see you all next week for uh, more Out on a Limb, I, I assume. Hopefully. I don't know. Maybe maybe not. Maybe this is the end. Surprisingly if short the arc, end of the if arc, not. If this was the end of the arc, Elliot, who would the interlude be from the perspective? It's Cherry Pop trying to steal the milk. <laughs> oh, yes. We finally get Pop, pop at the shops, we call it. Um, all right. Well, that's that. Now that we've said that, we can end the show. Yeah. <laughs>